Hello everyone. Uh, it seems like you can uh, see and hear me okay. We're going to talk a little bit about the um, the research book, the Craftswell research book. I'm talking um, about this idea of quantitative qualitative research, about some of the initial thinkings about their methods and so forth and so on. So I want you to kind of have your book out and we can kind of talk through some of these um, together. Okay, I want you to take a look at page four first and foremost and take a look at how he organizes these three uh, ways of doing research, qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods. We are going to spend most of our time throughout this class on qualitative methods. A lot of research in education that is done, connected to teachers and by teachers, and uh, with individuals that have a direct contact with uh, within the classroom are qualitative in nature. Of course, we can do surveys, we can do things that are connected to um, larger data collection, right, connection that will lead into kind of statistical analysis and kind of a, that try to, uh, to look at the more general kind of sets of information, which is quantitative kind of research. Um, we're going to look a little bit on that, but we're going to focus mostly on qualitative research. The aim of qualitative research is to look at social and human problems, all right? And, and again, the issue, just as we discussed in the first class, is not simply to see problems as something that have to be solved, something that we have to find a resolution to, but problems as issues, questions, notions um, that we can address, that we can tinker with, that we can try to lead to a new place, so to speak, right? And those are the kind of key elements for qualitative research, which is what we're going to be uh, focused mostly on. It. If you look at page five, um, all these three elements, the qualitative, the quantitative, and the mixed methods, which attempt to, to join uh, both qualitative and quantitative research, using parts of which that might be most significant to resolve an issue. Right, so, um, but you see all them come out of what in page four he calls the philosophical world. You might not have something that is directly philosophical um, having an impact on the research that you're going to do, but you're going to have a philosophical world here, right? You're going to have a way of considering and conceptualizing what it means, for instance, to be a teacher. What does it mean to, to be connected to uh, an environment of control in the classroom? Or what does it mean to be organized? Or what does it mean to um, develop musicianship or literacy, music? or regular literacy. Um, all those are part of a world view, right? If I think that, for instance, informal, informal education within our cl my classroom is important, my world view, view is kind of formed to an understanding that there are things that are best done with the direct guidance and intervention of a teacher. But I know also that there are other things that are best discovered, and therefore they're connected to this informality of learning with others, learning without a specific and very direct aim in mind. Right? This worldview comes from my understanding that learning is holistic, that is complex, that involves many aspects, and that if I'm always interacting in the same way and through the same form, I might not only be lacking something that I need to figure out on my own or that I need to learn through some search that, uh, that comes out of a question rather than something I need to um, to complete, to fulfill, right? But it comes out of an understanding that um, interaction as well as uh, self-discovery, as well as information, data-driven information, as well as kind of project-based structures are uh, form a certain complexity that helps, that optimizes learning, right? So all these are part of what he talks a little bit in terms of of philosophical worldviews, which I think it's it's interesting and it's important, right? So he talks about this a basic sets 
set of beliefs to guide action. And those are the kinds of things that we want to understand. One, an awareness of what are our beliefs and how we um, deepen them, how we connect them to further research, to things that other people have spent years looking at, carefully examining, um, interacting with people, collecting information so that they could be better informed, uh, as well as the kinds of outcomes that come out of it. What kinds of, you know, how do I change practice in music education, for instance? What are the best practices in terms of, of um, let's say, a band, right? Well, some of the best practices might be working with large ensembles, but also finding finding spaces to work with the smaller versions of this and stuff. You might be uh, preparing and engaging students with challenging repertoire, but knowing what does challenging mean in my context, not just challenge in the overall challenge, right? So that all students at high school at a high level should be doing this X, Y, and Z, but challenging in terms of what is it that my students have been playing, what is it they could play, and what is it that's going to be effective in terms of skill building, but also effective in terms of learning musicianship, also effective in terms of becoming more apt at interpretation, also effective in terms of generating a better sense of sound and interaction with uh, the repertoire, right? So, uh, best practice could be it is important to transmit and inform and have technology facilitating all these kinds of ways in which I can hear the same music being played by different groups, but it also might be something that links directly to how to students at times are challenged to develop uh, their own rehearsal, to organize a kind of musical learning on their own for, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, twice a week, right? So those kinds of things, that be, they are becoming very much best practice, all of them connected to research that people across the world have been doing in music education and band, for instance, right? Then we can cite and talk about that in many ways. So these are, again, these worldviews, which is the kinds of beliefs, the kinds of understandings that then lead us into practice. He talks about these four worldviews that are a little bit arbitrary, but they're nevertheless interesting to hear and to talk about, right? He talks about post-positivist, constructivist, advocacy, participatory, and pragmatist. I'll start with the idea of constructivist. And that is based on understanding. It's based on kind of multiple participation and meanings. And then there's a sense of kind of a theory generation and a kind of social history construction. Right. If you look at it and you Google constructivism, you're going to find all kinds of information about that. Those of you who have had the seminar curriculum before, have, we have talked about what constructivism means. And constructivism is connected mainly with the idea of social psychology and the work of Lev Vygotsky. Right? And the idea that we construct our own lives and we construct our own learning by interacting with others, by, by, help, by being helped by others to scaffold our learning. Right? And therefore, that we have to generate our own theories as well. This applies directly from learning into you know, pedagogy of learning into research as well. The kind of constructive approach is one in which I want to build up from very specific kind of sets of ideas, uh, which contrasts very, uh, very much to the post-positivist. The post-positivist is not interested in how the individual or a group of individuals uh, constructs their own learning. They're interested in Tra uh, organizing uh, the particular theory, a particular idea of how people behave, what happens when they interact, or a series of other things, and theorize about what would happen if I try to do this or if I try to do that. Right? Uh, the post-positivists are very much connected to the idea of hypothesis building. And a hypothesis always functions in trying to look at what would happen to a particular set of groups if I do a particular, um, if I try, if I test something upon them, right? And particularly what happens in relationship to a group that, to whom nothing is happening, right? This is traditional kind of uh, idea that is connected to uh, the natural science. So when you, you know, we have a drug company trying to develop a new uh, heart medicine, what they're going to try to do is they're going to do a particular set of things. They're going to put somebody in diet, they're going to control their sugar, and they're going to give you, them, them this, this drug, right? And then over time, they're going to see what happens to this. And the hypothesis is that the collaboration between those three things 
right, will actually improve their heart conditions. They do similar things, but now with the control group, you know, they do, they give them, rather than the drug, the placebo, right? So they think they're taking the drug, so psychologically they're still connected to it, but they're actually not receiving any treatment, and they compare the two. Right, so post-positivism is very uh, reductionist. They try, they, they see the complexity in the work can be reduced to something very specific. And you can imagine that this is easier done in natural science and medicine and than it is, or physics or, or, uh, or biology, than it is in education or in psychology, although many psychologists try to do that as well. Right, but human and complex human interactions such as schooling, which depend on a lot of different things, depend on who I am, depend on my family, depend on the context, depend on the environment, depends on economics, culture, all kinds of things, right, become much more difficult to deal with, with this post-positivist idea. That oftentimes, as I said, to, to reduce these things and try to create a certain level of determination. They say basically that if you do this, something will happen that is immediately connected to this action. Well, if you think in, in terms of psychology, you can Google the, no, the name Thorndike, and you see a lot of the psychological experiments that were very much sequential, very much understanding a sense of that, that things can be, um, you, you know, empirically tried out and they are determined by certain things. Another kind of, uh, of research paradigm that is mostly qualitative is the participatory or advocacy base. These are very much connected to things like we saw, for instance, with um, Jacobo Nietzsche in that first presentation that we saw. Jacobo has this idea of participatory literacy, and the aim is to connect El Sistema with a pattern of change. Right? So these kinds of um, agendas for um, for educational research are very much connected to political issues uh, and, uh, for instance, policy issues. And they're connected to populations, perhaps, that sometimes don't have a lot of voice, or they might be minorities, the disenfranchised. And the aims is really kind of to interact, and, to, to develop a conversation, to develop a kind of way of looking at something that might change not only my own participation, how I see it, might give me different ideas of how this functions, right? And the, the, the aim is also to bring along participants uh, to help them to see themselves differently, to think about something different, to have what, what um, Craswell calls in, uh, on page not, uh, 10 the idea of an emancipatory view. Right? The post uh, the post positive this they're only trying they're, they're trying to just simply see if what they think is going to happen will happen if I do this. Right? So in music education you you have some old studies for instance that say well what happens with clarinet playing if the kid has braces? Right? So something very direct that I can see immediately. The constructivists are trying to see about the process. Well, the uh, advocacy participatory, they're trying to see about context and trying to see it to look about change, right? And then we have a pragmatic view, which is kind of a, a little bit of in-between of all them, right? And they mix different things, and the issue is really to pragmatics. It's this conceptual, but does this conception has an application in practice. It can be connected to theory, to, to politics, it can be connected to this construction of knowledge, but do we see a link, a direct link between specific ideas and the pragmatic application of it, right? So those are things that we're going to come back and we're going to think more and more and more about that. But I want you to just have a sense of what they are, helping you to think through what you've read. On page 12 and 13, Craswell proceeds to think about quantitative, qualitative, and strategies of how to collect data. We're going to look a lot in what's in page 13, particularly these strategies that are ethnography, the case studies, phenomenology, and one that is not there, which is called action research. Ethnography is based on a lot of information that we know about how the way people work and how you know, ethnography can be traditionally seen by, for instance, what anthropologists have done. They go into a place, they study in depth the details about uh, you know, an environment and how people behave that and what they do and so forth and so on. So the purpose is that in-depth information. 
all qualitative research is interesting, this kind of rich text, right? This kind of rich and deep and, in, and embedded data, right? Something that, that can talk about the complexities of places rather than the overall perception of places. Um, case studies are another kind of strategy that looked at particular spaces, right? Something that is unique. Remember when Ari Nemzer presented his case study. It was a particular camp that has particular conditions, although it is connected to other camps in some ways. And we're going to study more about that. The phenomenological is usually connected to an individual. It looks at a phenomenon, an idea, a purpose, but it's also usually connected to how individuals see, how they respond. It's something that's very intimate, it's very connected to kind of personality, subjective ideas. Right? And then action research is oftentimes connected to, as the name says, to things that are happening in practice. So a lot of teacher research that happens in their own classroom is connected to action research. So all those are qualitative research paradigm, kind of uh, ways of looking strategies that we're going to discuss more throughout the course. But I think it's important that you kind of have a sense of that. Um, part of what I'm asking you to do the following week is to get into groups of two and select one of these group, one of these groups, right? One of these strategies: ethnography, case study, phenomenology, or action research, and. Um, you're going to do a presentation for us uh, as the weeks evolve. Okay, so pay attention to that. We might have a couple groups of three because we because of the numbers we have in the class, but uh, two or three. Kind of select that, connect to somebody else, choose something, and we're going to organize that. On page 12, when you look, you see the kind of quantitative elements, and you see two kind of different things. They're very complex, and we're going to continue to work on them. But I think that at the surface, you can understand that a survey is something generated that's in So I, I do a survey, for instance, of all the alums at FIU. And I, what I want to know is um, what their perceptions were of FIU, how they see FIU today, and it, what would take for them to become more participative in the life of the university. Right? It's a typical thing that university does. It's a survey sending out, so they get the kind of general feeling across the board, and out of that they select where the kind of key things that people are saying. They say, oh, here's what you know, your population, all the alums, are saying about their engagement with FIU and what it would take to become more close to them. Right? That's the key thing of a survey. I want to know what kind of a general thing about a large group of people. The experimental researchers are connected to what I articulated earlier in terms of, let's say, the drugs. Right? I do two groups, I control, and I try to do something, a regimen or a regimen of exercise, a regimen of drugs, so forth, so forth and so on. And we're going to explore these a little bit more. Mixed methods try to combine both, and um, don't worry too much about that right now, but uh, you know, continue to look, uh, we'll continue to look at this forward. So I want you to end by going to page 17. And so looking at those two columns there uh, between quantitative and qualitative particularly and see that all these things that we have talked about, particularly the use this practice research as a researcher, right? You can see that their quantitative is a lot more connected to, to tests, to identifying variables so that you can control so that what you think you're researching is actually researching. You know, some observations are very detached, you know, interviews, if there's any interviews, they're always structured interviews. On the qualitative side, it's much more personal, it's much more interactive, it's much more about knowing the details, right, of the full story, so to speak, rather than trying a hypothesis or seeing the big picture, which is usually what happens with quantitative research. Okay, so this is a, this kind of a joining in or kind of a key um, reference for this first um, chapter. Take a look at some of the terms and things that we discussed here uh, as the weeks go by and uh, start paying attention to them. Start, um, if you have questions, write them down in your no notebook. If you have suggestions, you know, if you Google something you find, reserve, start doing that and then or share them with us. 
Those are kind of key precepts that we'll continue to develop and understand. So if you were, if you're confused, don't, 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 you know, don't get too excited about that. We're going to continue to get back to these and we'll continue to see those in practice and try them out in the kind of real world and why they matter in terms of how we teach, in terms of how we learn, uh, and how we interact with our students. Okay? All right. Bye-bye.